Welcome to the Nature Photo Guys podcast, where we talk about nature photography from gear to our philosophies and everything in between. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back and relax. You're listening to Joe DeJardin and Chris Gibbs, the Nature Photo Guys. Hey guys, welcome back to the Nature Photo Guys podcast. We are excited to be joined by an award-winning wildlife photographer and videographer whose work has been published both online and in print by National Geographic, BBC Wild, Birds and Blooms, just to name a few. Based out of Pennsylvania, his journey through the lens has taken him on a visual exploration all over the world. Through both his amazing images and video, his exceptional work captures the untamed beauty of nature. Join us as we explore the passion behind the frames and unveil the true professional behind the camera. Please welcome to the show, Harry Collins. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Welcome. Mr. Harry, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> not too bad, not too bad. Uh, you got quite the intro there, Chris. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> well, we're talking to the man here, so you know. Yeah, <laughs> you betcha. Well, um... We're, we're happy to finally get you on there, Harry. I know, uh, you know, we had to reschedule a few times, but uh, that's just uh, how life is and schedules work and all that yeah. kind of good stuff. So we're all super busy. So you bet. Yeah. And no, I appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah. Definitely been busy the last six months or so. So. So, yeah, you've been traveling a lot last six months, that sort of thing. Yeah, pretty much since August. Um, so I'm happy. I never wow. thought I'd say it, but I'm happy to be home for a little while. I got a lot of catching up to do and. Yeah, sure. Well, we've seen you in the fall too, in in, uh, in Jasper there. So yeah. Um, and at that time, you were saying you're you know right after that, you're on to the next one, on to the next one, that sort of thing. So it's nice to get away. It's always nice to be home, right? Yeah, and having a young son too. So it's always hard. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's going to be hard being away from home until he can actually get the camera in his hands too, right? Yeah, Start I'm trying. On those trips. I'm trying. He's starting, but. <laughs> 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 awesome. So uh, we're going to just get right into it there, Harry. Um, you know, we got a yep. list of about 76 questions. For you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, we, we got uh, a few questions here. So, uh, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the standard um, question for everyone is to tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, I've been a, I guess, full time, whatever you want to call it, professional wildlife photographer since maybe 2017, I think it was. Um, you know, I had one. I was one of the winners anyway in the 2017 National Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year. And that kind of propelled me onto the next level there. And, um, you know, I was running tours, workshops and all that kind of stuff for a while. And then the last few years, as kind of everything is changing between photography and videography, videography, um, I'm starting to do a lot more filming now. And I actually work with a motion picture company where I kind of fill holes in a lot of gaps of storylines where uh, production teams maybe haven't gotten the footage that they want. They reach out to me and a couple other people and, um, you know, we get a list biweekly, monthly, whatever, however often they're working on projects. And it says, do you have any of this footage type thing? And then uh, in some instances, I may go out and film for them specifically. Um, nice. So, yeah, a lot of different aspects Absolutely. to what I do. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Doing. Well, you, you got to be a little bit diversified when it comes to um, uh, for sure. the, uh, the livelihood or, yeah, uh, making a living with nature photography. Yeah. You can't just everything's rapidly changing these days for sure. So. Yeah. Oh, it is for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, you, you can't just count on selling prints or you yeah, just can't right. count <laughs> on stock or you just, you yeah, know, you, you have, have to be fingers diversified in, in, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And everything. Yeah. Right. So stock, stock every year, they seem to take more and more and we get less and less. So that kind of drove me away from that a little bit. It did sure. eh? on okay. the stock photo side, but stock footage yeah. side, you're still involved in a bit there. I am. Yeah. I mean, I have, for the, I mean, the positive thing about it, it's kind of passive income, you know, once it's uploaded, it's yeah. there forever. And it just mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it irritates me a little bit that they take, you know, up to 70, 80% of it and you're getting 20 and every year that sure. seems to go up and wow. up for them and down for the creators. And yeah, it's, it's a challenge. So and it's hard to make video? it full time. Video is a little different. Um, and every site, every agency is different. You know, they all have their tiers mm -hmm. of how they pay. And you sure. Know, but generally, yeah. general rule of thumb is usually 70% to the agency, 30% ballpark, you know, to the photographer, or videographer. Wow. And there's some subscription models there now, too, that kind of hamper. Yeah. I mean, you're seeing too, you right? get sales so. where you're making two cents on a sale. It's like, right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no kidding. Anyway. So. Okay, so before that though, Harry, before, prior to 2017, you you were obviously been shooting for a while. Like, when did you kind of first get into uh, uh, photography? 
Yeah, I kind of had a, f- a little bit of a funny interest story. So we went on a family vacation in the, I don't know, mid early 2000s to Alaska. And I had a little point and shoot Kodak thing. And I took these horrible, horrible photos of eagles and all these other things that, you know, I used to hang on the wall that were the greatest photos at the time. And I look back yeah. at them now, yeah. and, you know, like everybody, yeah. you know, you got to start somewhere. But, but I remember mm-hmm. I was out, we were on a cruise and I saw somebody on the cruise with, at the time, it was the biggest lens I'd ever seen in my life. Thinking back, it was probably like a Canon 100 to 400 or something like that. But to me, it looked enormous, mm-hmm. you know? Sure. So we stopped at yeah, a little port sure. town in, in Juneau and there was a camera store there and I took my Kodak point and shoot into the camera store. And I was like, how do I get the lens off so I can get a bigger lens? You know, and I, I vividly remember the guy at the store <laughs> laughing at me because it's like, yeah, I didn't know. I had no nice. idea what I was doing. And it's like, I always sure, want to go back yeah. and find that guy, you know, who's laughing yeah, anyway. But that's kind of where it started. Um, you know, and then I had moved wow. to Florida shortly after that and wildlife in Florida. I don't know if you've been, but it's everywhere. Birds, especially and Osprey Eagles and, one thing kind of just led to another and I became obsessed with it. And, um, you know, I bought a Nikon, Nikon D40, <gasps> I think was what I started with. <laughs> so, did you say Nikon? And, uh, I did. <laughs> yeah, sore subject, but, uh, yeah, I went through the ranks of Nikon for quite a while. You know, I, I, I went up to the D5 and the 600 F4 and I loved it. Um, but I remember I had reached out to Nikon a few times once I started running workshops and I was kind of trying to get them to work with me. And, um, you know, they weren't really very responsive and Canon at the time, which I had never even held a Canon camera in my hand was willing. They sent a rep out to one of my tours with a van full of equipment for all my guests to try everything they made. And, oh, wow. you know, nice. it was super, I mean, uh, and it's mutually beneficial, you know, the guests get to try it. Canon makes up sales. Mm-hmm. To me, it was a no brainer. Sure. Um, oh, for sure. but I got the R5 and the 100 to 500 in my hand. This was right after it came out for the first time. And I mean, that was it. And, you know, it, it took maybe an hour of shooting with that. And I'm like, I got to get this, you know, and at the time I wasn't really ready to switch and Nikon just, you know, I tried their, at the time it was the Nikon Z7, I think I had, or the Z7 II. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And it just was not made for wildlife. You know, it just, it was too slow. It would take like four seconds to wake up when it would go to sleep. Oh, you crazy. Would, the blackout between frames was just brutal, you know, and, and uh, I just I couldn't do it. And it just didn't seem at the time like Nikon was really committed to mirrorless. And, you know, so I made the hard decision to switch to Canon and kind of haven't really <laughs> regretted it since. I've been super happy with everything. So good to nice. hear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that was going to be one of the questions. Photographers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Um, what um, so your I guess your go to lens um for the, the subjects you photograph is the the 600 or? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I have a 600 F4. I have the old DSLR, mm-hmm. the 400 F4 DO version two. Oh, yeah. uh, super, oh, nice. super yeah, yeah. underrated lens. I love that lens a lot. Mm-hmm. Small, tiny, lightweight F4. You know, it's great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the 100 nice. to 500, uh, which, um, you know, I we were talking about earlier. I recently put out a video about that. And it was like, as I was putting this video together about, using it for three years, I was like, Oh my gosh, I don't really realize how much I've used that lens over my 600 and how much stuff that I shot on that. And, and for video, especially, you know, anybody that shot video with a 600 F4 can probably attest to it's not conducive to video. It's it, there's, it's a challenge, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're really yeah. seeing your wobbles and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah. sometimes less is more. And especially for framing purposes, you know, I find with video, I like to zoom more, way further out than what I'm used to with photography so that I can recompose later mm-hmm. because, you know, as you're tracking a subject moving in video, it's not like photos where you can just pick that one frame, you know, you got to really be consistent as you're tracking something and it's hard to fix. So there's times where, you know, maybe in photography, if I want to shoot at, let's just say 400 millimeter, as if I'm shooting that same subject in video, I'm shooting at 100 or 200 millimeters so that I can one, not be super shaky and two, I can recompose all that yeah. later. So um, sure. You know, I found that you know the 100 to 500 has been phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, in in, in Premiere, you can you can handle you can use the warp stabilizer and fix things a little bit. But if you're in too far and there's that jerky yep. mov- movement, like warp stabilizer mm-hmm. does, it doesn't really like that, right? So uh, you're right, absolutely, you got to be out a little bit. No, and sometimes you get that jello mold look. Oh, and, you know, yeah, yeah, frustrates me when I see that. So yeah, right. And anytime you're as you know, I'm sure as you stabilize, it's basically stretching that image. So it's, 
Oh, sometimes for it's, sure. you know, yeah. you may have a moose that's on the edge of the frame or whatever animal and you stabilize it. Now all of a sudden the face shoots over to the side and it's, Whoa, you know, so oh, you gotta exactly. really leave yourself. No, it's, it's, not you a, know, it's not a good scenario for sure. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's times where, you know, I'll shoot, like I said, either zoom further out or I'll shoot 6k or rarely, but sometimes 8k just to downsample to 4k later, just for that extra room, you know? Or cropping ability. One okay, guys, but. enough of this this video. I, I don't even understand. No, <laughs> no, no, let's continue. Uh, I'm like <laughs> this. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I got a question for you though, Harry. Um, so yeah. the, one of the main reasons why I didn't go to the 100 to 500 RF yet is because mm -hmm. shooting the one to 400, that uh, EF to RF adapter with the built-in ND for video mm -hmm. has just oh, been yeah. phenomenal. So the yeah. last three years, uh, or yeah, well, no, couple not the last few years. Yeah. yeah, a couple of years since I've had the R5. And prior mm -hmm. to that, when I was shooting the, the Lumix G9, I would have, um, well, not the Lumix G9, sorry, with the R5. So that variable ND really helped with, you know, balancing the proper exposure for the shutter speeds I wanted to work with, right? How do mm -hmm. you get around, like, are you using NDs on the front of the 1, the 5 then? Because I find that just having that adapter there with the with the scroll wheel like you know the the variable nd it's just been phenomenal yeah. for that uh yeah i have a little bit more cumbersome <clears throat> i use a map box um because all my filters oh you do are the big, okay yeah i have i don't have a lot of screw on or magnetic ones i have the longer you know the 100 millimeter by 150 millimeter i think they are that clip into this okay so, um yeah so i tend to use that a lot um the other thing that i'm finding surprisingly is I do shoot a lot of 120 frames per second these days, especially wildlife. So, mm -hmm. you know, not to bore everybody with the proper shutter speeds, but, you know, you want to be at one two fiftieth of a second shutter speed. So a lot of times that coupled with shooting at like F11 is it's OK. I'm getting away these days without using filters as much as I used to, because now I'm starting oh, nice. to get into faster shutter speeds. Um, that said, you know when I'm in Florida, things like that, where it's just super, super sunny, there's, you know, yeah, I know some, I sometimes need a 10 stop filter on the front of there just to keep the sun out. So, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, oh, wow. I do my best to not use filters. They, they introduce a lot of lens flare, you know, things like that. Um, the cheaper ones, you know, a lot of people buy though, you'll get a purple color cast, things like that. So filters, anything between the glass and the sensor, yeah, I mean, for sure. another yeah. point for something to go wrong. So, the best I can avoid that I do. Otherwise, yes, I do use a map box. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not uh, all that up on, on the video side. I mean, I try, but uh, for the ND uh, or um, using the NDs and, and, you know, wanting to keep those wide open apertures, it seems to me that you're okay with stopping down to F11 for video to make I sure am, everything's yeah. in, in sharp focus. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, it's just a you're little not, bit more you're forgiving. You're not worried about that F F4 look? No, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, generally, you know, if yes and no, um, that's a kind of a loaded question. Uh, uh, yeah. Ideally, yeah, that would be nice to always have. But especially with video, too, I mean, these days, um, so I come from a, a cinema background shooting on more cinema. Ca I used to shoot on Sony cinema cameras a lot before mirrorless. So okay, I'm still nice. kind of hung up on the old school version of everything should be manual focus when you're shooting video. Uh, it's hard for me to trust autofocus these days, even though it's getting better and better. But with video, you know, you get that once in a lifetime moment, it, it's, it slips out of focus, you're done, you know? So, it, you know, I do still manually focus a lot. So I do like to have a greater depth of field there, but I am starting to slowly come around more to, to auto focus these you. days. So for, for me, I have, I, so the two bodies that I use is the R5 and the R5C. So the R5C having the built-in mm -hmm. um, uh, photo, Canon photo system, as well as the cinema system is kind of the hybrid there. Um, the mm -hmm. part that I have a problem with is this, the R5C doesn't have the stabilization. It's only in the lenses right. that you use, you know what I mean? So, right, so what right. I've been doing is on the R5 using the, the adapter, um, but on the R5C, anything I do, I use the map box as well. We use the, I use the case, case movie mate map box, but then I have the, mm -hmm. I use the Ninja to, uh, my eyes are getting, as I get older, my eyes are, aren't getting as good. So I use the Ninja to see yep. better. And then when I'm manually focusing, you can actually see the peak focus better. Do you do the same kind of thing right. with the, with an external yep, screen? Absolutely. I do the same. And I'm also, I'm recording ProRes at 60 frames on my Atomos while I record 120 frames internally. So that I have the flexibility of both. Oh, you are. Um, a lot of the, yeah. So a lot of the companies that I work with, the um, the the bit depth on the Canon cameras are just not enough. They're not high enough. The R five C is the exception, but on the R three and the R five, um, 
I shouldn't say that the R3, if you shoot raw, it's okay. Um, but the standard formats that sure. most people shoot in for social media, great. But when you're talking, you know, high end production, I actually lost some big contracts because, uh, I had a, a pretty high end Apple TV. I can't say the name of the show, but they wanted to buy basically my entire yeah. library of elk footage. Couldn't buy any of it because it wasn't up to their specs, even though 99% of the people aren't going to see the difference, oh. you know, they have their right. Netflix approved yeah. cameras, their Apple TV camera, you know, and all that stuff. So, so now as much as I can, I travel with my Atomos exactly. and I record simultaneously to them because you just never know. So, you know, you may see that once in a lifetime thing and, you know, so that's how it goes. But. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and I've been doing a lot of uh, 8K recording on the Atomos Ninja just so I can actually crop in a little bit and be able to still get the high quality 4K at the end of the day. Right. Yep. But I mean, obviously it doesn't do 120 yep. frames per second, which is what I also like these days too. You know, like you're saying, so it's a kind of a battle back and forth for sure on those scenarios. But yeah. So my question then is, um, the two formats. So, uh, if you can't record the 120 frames per second on the Atomos, they're, they, they're still okay with the 60 then. Yeah. So the codec on the, the 120 frames per second in camera. Uh, so it's great for YouTube. It's great for Instagram and all that stuff. And you get this beautiful, smooth footage, but mm -hmm. the color space becomes smaller. Um, the codecs are different, all that kind of stuff. And when you see it on a, on a big screen and you try to heavily edit this stuff, that's where it starts to break down. Um, so by shooting ProRes oh, on the okay. Atomos, you get a little bit more. It's almost, it's basically raw versus JPEG almost, you know, the comparative photography. Oh, it's serious. Oh, pretty, wow. pretty broad For term. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's not one to one, but that's the best way I would compare the two. Um, you know, you're, you're shooting in JPEG to, to post on social media versus raw where you're in these extreme situations where you need to edit to match other color spaces in the same series. You know, you got to think a lot of these guys that are making, documentaries they're piece and none of those storylines you're seeing are ever start to finish they film that not none of them but the most majority of them no. they're piecing stuff together no. sometimes over years you know so they have to be able to match all these color spaces from different cameras and all that kind of stuff and make it look like they shot it one to one you know and in, a, in an actual mm -hmm. series all for the time. sure so you need the, the the whole palette of colors to be able to do that and shooting just the basic yeah, formats exactly. It's just not there all the time. So, so if you've ever shot on a red, or if, um, if you've heard about their dynamic range, they have they claim sixteen, the new one seventeen stops of dynamic range. Um, I've shot on them before, and if you look at the foot, I mean, stuff where you're shooting into it just looks like blown out white, and you crush those highlights back down, and it's like you could see every single detail. I mean, it's unbelievable. So. That's where they make their money is in the dynamic Crazy. range, in my opinion. Outside of that, you know, if you put the footage side by side, 99.9% .9 of people aren't going to be able to say that definitively. That's the red. That's the camera sure. until you get into those scenarios, sure. uh, in my opinion, anyway. But. No, fair enough. Yeah. You know, you know, Harry, we get a lot of questions all the time. I mean, I get this question so many times from people who are just into, you know, getting into video and, and, you know, their, their question is always, can you take a, a still from video? And it's always that whole conversation about, you know, two times the shutter speed and all that and the it motion read. blur and whatnot. What do you find uh, the photos that you take and the video you take? Are you actually shooting twice? Or are you, are you, um, you know, I'm assuming you're having motion blur too, based on the double the shutter speed. So What's your game? Do you do you go for the video camera? Do you go for the for the photo side? Is it a battle in your head all the time? What should I do? Or I guess if you have uh, projects you're working on, uh, so that's it's always 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 the the challenge, yeah. right? So um, <laughs> there it is. For, for for me, it's <laughs> it's kind of like you have that. <laughs> yeah, it's almost that split second decision to almost process in your mind: is this going to be a better YouTube video or a better photo, mm -hmm. you know, right. and sadly yeah. that's the world we're in now. Like, how's this going to do on social media? You know, so sure. oh, um, 100%. <laughs> bugling the loons calling that stuff to me, it's yeah. video, video every time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The behavior for sure. Right. So my most, you know, famous video in Africa was the lion that took down the hippo. If you've seen it. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I saw so, that. Yeah. yeah. I had this like horrible internal battle as that was building up of what am I going to do here? Um, and I mean, I, to the point where I was like almost <laughs> shaking, having like a panic attack. And thankfully our guide said, <laughs> if you're not filming this, you, be you better be because I've never seen this in 30 years. So to me, that was the decision. Okay. I'm going to film wow. this and sure enough, the rest was history and millions of views later. And that kind of built up my YouTube channel and stuff. So that one, I made the right decision. Now the, 
I guess the con to that is had I lost focus or screwed that up somehow, I lost that whole series, you know, whereas I could have salvaged a few photos. So, right. So there's, I can't really give you a, this is how I do sure. it. It's really every scenario is different. If I already have, let's say, you know, this year I went when I was in Canada around the time when I saw you guys, one of my main goals, I wanted to film great gray owls this year. I photographed them a hundred times, never really filmed them. So but there I am, I'm out there nice. yeah, diving yeah. for a vol in the field and I find myself trying to, I, I want to switch the photos so bad, but it's like, no, this is why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, you know, so I'm still yeah. a photographer at heart, but um, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's, yeah. it's always a tough decision. It's a tough one. So no matter what your skill level is, it's always a battle is what you're saying. <laughs> it, it really is. Yeah. And like you said, unless you're dedicated to one or the other, that's why I, I kind of, I, I, I almost want to go full cinema camera again, just because then I don't have the choice. You know, it's just yeah. one or the other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I have the same problem. I, I was carrying two cameras. Okay. This is going to be my photo scenario. I, I keep renting the 400 to eight. I absolutely love that lens. And I keep oh, going yeah. back to that and, and it's just a beautiful lens. So I can't afford it. So I keep renting it. But, um, you know, so I decided I was going to use that, but then go with the R5C, use that as my video camera, you know, on that side of things. But mm. man, it just without that stabilization, hand holding that, you know, with grizzlies outside the truck kind of thing. And there's just the stability there yeah. isn't what the R5 has. And uh, right. I wish they'd add stability to that a little bit, but maybe yeah. the Mark II. Yeah, will have it. a, I don't know. Big, yeah, it's kind of weird to me too, because I, and, a lot of cinema lenses, they, they can't support moving sensors. I mean, I'm sure Chris, you probably know this, but, sure. um, that, you know, that's why they don't have it in there. You know, you have to have a stable sensor for the cinema lenses. But to me, I don't, I, right. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I think the majority of people are you and me that do both yeah. that have the L lenses. We don't have the, the PL lenses, the cinema lenses that are trying to put it on. You know, if you have a, a Canon, 50 to a thousand millimeter, you're not putting an R5C on it. You're putting a red on it or oh. something like that. So, no. you know, it's, no, exactly. You know, so, so, and I don't have a hundred right. grand for that lens. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't know if it was because of the cooling that they made that decision or not, but anyway, I, I sure. <laughs> no, fair enough. Yeah, exactly. Have you uh, had any success, uh, Harry, uh, pulling stills from your videos? Like, has anybody ever asked, uh, oh, you know, from the sequence, uh, I wish I could, you know, like a, buy a photo or you wanted to print something? Um, uh, have you had, have you done that for one? Like, have you actually pulled stills that you were able to print or, or sell or? I've, I've never done them as prints that I've sold. I have uploaded them to sock mm -hmm. agencies. Mm -hmm. They've been accepted to those. Oh, um, great. Physical prints. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm super picky. So the, the prints part of it, you know, to me, it's like when I look at it on a big monitor, it, it just doesn't look the same as a photo. Yeah. I agreed. Snuck a few in on social media for sure. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh, sure. So, Smaller format. You know, most sure. people. Yeah. Right. Right. So, you know, when I found myself in those scenarios where I couldn't decide what I wanted, photo or, or video, um, you know, I was able to a couple of times sneak a, a couple stills out of out of a video clip at least. But um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's really thumbnail mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Right. <laughs> yep. So, so speaking of all this, is there actually um, a favorite subject you like to photograph or take video or is it primarily uh, uh, the wild kingdom kind of thing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, I started with it was funny for like for years, I was kind of a bird photographer, even though I was wasn't really like super into birds. It was just where I live. I live in, as you, you know, I think you mentioned in the beginning, I'm in Pennsylvania. There's not a lot of stuff in our area to shoot, especially mammals wise. Um, so by default, I kind of became a bird photographer, specifically birds of prey. So, you know, I always am kind of partial to them, eagles, osprey, owls. Um, but the last few years I've been fortunate enough to having gone to Africa a couple of times and now up to Alaska with the bears. Um, mm -hmm. it's hard to top that. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, no how kidding. to top lions Jeez. and bears and, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you betcha. Africa is still on my list of places to visit it's kind of one of those um at the top of the um what do you call those uh the wish Your list, bucket I guess, list right? i guess yeah bucket list uh, yeah. places to go right so it'll ruin you it ruins every other spot <laughs> it's just, i mean it's amazing so. nice <laughs> nice now, now now i'm going to be wanting to get a lion attacking a hippo though i'm you know yeah. isn't that everywhere like what the heck? <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, every time you go, it's it's in the brochure. So. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah it's a, oh, there's Harry's photo. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, so. Um, so you know, we kind of talked about uh, the cameras, the gear. Um, 
other and the Atomos, but is there any uh, is there any other like key pieces of uh, gear on the video side um, that are essential for you? I mean, you know, like we talked about the external monitor, um, mm -hmm. the Atomos, but do you use like a shotgun mic? Do you use uh, you just mentioned you use the mat box, but is there anything else? Um, are you carrying a, um, um, you know, a heavy duty um, tripod with a fluid head or, cause some of the videos I've seen you, um, you, you've been, you're hand holding a lot of it. Right. So, and it seems yeah. like it's, it's a real quick run and gun. I didn't like the, the one, the 500 review, I didn't see like a monitor. I don't think I seen a monitor mounted to the camera. So no tripod is there, on the kayak. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No tripod on <laughs> yeah, the kayak. Right. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, so is there anything um, you'd, you'd add to that or? Yeah. Great question. Uh, definitely a hundred percent. The most important thing is the, the tripod, even though I'm guilty of it a lot. Uh, I, I definitely handhold in Jasper, for scenarios. Instance. like you said, Jasper, you know, you're jumping out of the car. You don't have time to set up a video yeah. tripod and, get your fluid no. head out and all this stuff. But yeah. Um, you know, when I'm going out and, you know, and especially for commercial footage, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's imperative. You have to have, um, tripods. It, it doesn't matter what kind of to use a try. I mean, it's to me, I think that kind of separates a lot of the amateur video is you'll see the shaking and the jerking and all that kind of stuff. You mm -hmm. want to get to the next Agreed. level, get a good fluid head. And yeah. I, I started with a Manfrotto, I think it was the 502 there. You can get them used for like 150 bucks now. I mean, they're super That's cheap. That's what we got. That's what That's we pulled what we're out. Using. Used, yeah. yeah. Used it for probably seven years. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. absolutely okay. nothing wrong with it. Great to get you in. Now that said, once you use a higher end one, it kind of, it's hard to go. It's like driving the like Cadillac all of a sudden. It's hard to go yeah. back, you know? Um, I bet. I, yeah. I personally You're paying for it, with, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so I shoot with Car the Cartoni brand. Um Expensive, heavy, but, you know, I make a living off it. So it's, you know, I could justify yeah. it. Maybe not everybody out there can. Um, so definitely, <laughs> even, like I said, even if it's the, you know, the, the starter one, whatever, the fluid heads are going to give you much sure. better results than a photography gimbal will. Mm -hmm. The gimbals are too loose, in my opinion, mm -hmm. and they, they're shaky. You're going to overpan a lot. Um, you want resistance, any kind of resistance. That's, yeah, that's what I've noticed. That, yeah. 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 So a lot of the trips I go on now, there, it, there's a lot of weight restrictions. Um, so bringing mm. big, heavy tripods is, is an issue. So what I did is um, my photography tripod is the, I have the Pro Media gear legs, which are super light. And then I bought, I wish I had it here to show you, but I got a Gitzo. Gitzo makes a gimbal that's actually a fluid head. So it's kind of a nice hybrid solution. Um, it has a lot of uh, tension in it. So um, it's not as customizable as a fluid head, but it is tighter than a normal gimbal. So it does kind of fight you a little bit. So it keeps you from doing the fast motion. Um, so if nothing else, you know, I think that's a good alternative. It's a good hybrid. If you're doing both photography and videography, huh. if you want to get serious about oh, video fluid head all the way. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, audio, sure. I do two things. I have a, a road, um, whatever the road, my video mic pro is that mounts on the camera. And then I also have a secondary setup, um, which is a, I use a Sennheiser shotgun mic attached to a zoom, a little zoom external recorder that has oh, a 32 yeah. bit float. Yeah. Um, so that way I could set that out somewhere because especially here and you guys, I mean, you see it in Jasper, you're out there shooting, you got people walking up to you. What are you taking pictures of? You know, that's great for your, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> And the car is driving. Or you get the shutter the, going like crazy of the guy beside yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Right? So. And you know the the, the the leaves rustling all around you and all that kind of stuff. So totally. getting audio, I think, is yeah. out of all of it. I think that's actually the most challenging part. And you know, you post a reel with music in it, and then you get the people. Why are you reeling it with the music? And well, <laughs> if you could come out with me and see, you know. So yeah, <laughs> I, I once posted a reel and I said, "This is what for all you that complain. This is why." And I posted a video of an owl. And there's people walking up, look, there's an owl in the tree. And they're, you know, uh, all the, mm -hmm. that was the whole yeah, for sure. So this is why, this is why, unfortunately, we have to use music. And there's so <laughs> many people there, you know, depending on your location, you know, in the busy time of years in the, in this, in the specific areas, there's so many people there. And sometimes there's 10 people behind you chatting and all this, and it's just impossible yep. to get audio, but you just want to catch that elk bugling or whatever. Right. So. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Uh, the one year while I was running a workshop in Waterton, there were um there was a cinematographer there um uh recording the elk rut and they had actually flown in uh a separate audio guy and that's mm. all he did i guess he was one of the best in the world they flew him in from the uk or something and uh 
I guess they had had permission from parks. Um, he had to be brought in and taken out in certain areas where, um, you know, foot traffic isn't allowed, like you're not allowed to go. And he'd actually uh-huh. place these mics in there. And so he was, and then he'd be back at his vehicle, uh, you know, with the, the headset on and, all, you know, just recording all this audio of uh, all the, uh, the elk, you know, the bugling, the fighting and everything. Sure, and then yeah. At the end of the day, they'd go back in and then he'd take the mics out or replay or, or reset them or something. It was really cool to watch just, just yeah, to yeah. see that, you know, um, the guy taking the video didn't care if you went up and said hi or whatever. He's, hmm. I mean, besides bothering him, but it, what it meant was he wasn't worried about audio at all. They had a separate right, right. guy just doing it all. Right. So it was pretty cool to, to actually see that happening. It's, yeah. And, and that's yeah. one of the, uh, the limitations too, with Canon <clears throat> that I don't like, um, one of the rare times I'll give uh, Nikon credit for this because they do allow it, but it was when you, when you shoot in 120 frames per second, you can't record audio. So, um, so even if you want to speed that footage back up, you have no original audio. So that's what kind of prompted me to start carrying uh, an external recorder. And then I could try to sync it back up later. Sure. And, uh, so early on when I first started doing video, we have a small, um, elk population in Pennsylvania here. I would actually go out at night when nobody was out there and I just record a bunch of bugles and then I would just try to find ones that matched and try to sync it all up. And it was just becoming such nice. a headache because you know, it's, you're trying to get the mouth movements yeah. to match the audio. And so, I, you know, but it, it was just such a pain. So. That's the one good thing about the R5C. You can actually record 120 frames per second and a separate audio track. You can actually pull them because mm. it does have the cinema side of things. Oh, but right, but right, again, right. it's yep. the, it's the, you know, if, if you're on a tripod, Cool. But if you're not on a tripod, mm. I don't really trust the stability there. So cool. Anything else uh, you, you could uh, add to that, Harry, as far as, um, uh, you know, video accessories or stuff you, you use? I mean, it sounds like it's a pretty tight kit. Like you've got absolutely, you know, you know the best for, for what you need. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, you're using uh, uh, CF Express cards for the Canon stuff. Well, actually, no. I guess you'd use that primarily for photo. Uh, no, you're actually recording the both. You said so. That's uh, yeah. that's not an issue there. Um, yeah, yeah. They, I have it split. The Atomos has the hard drive built into it, so I well the external one that you put right into the Atomos. Mm-hmm. So I recorded that. Yeah, and then I do the CF Express. I actually split my uh, Canon camera, so my mm-hmm. video goes to the CF Express, and then my Unfortunately, Canon still use an SD card. So then the photos go to the SD card since that can kind of handle the speeds a little bit better. And because otherwise, you know, eight, I think on a 128 gig card, you're getting like seven or eight minutes of video. So I don't want the photos mixed in with because I'm constantly swapping out cards uh, for video. Oh, um, the only other thing that I could think that I use, uh, the only other accessory is I do use a focus puller on the side for manual focus. I know a lot of people, I'll just touch on this quickly, but um, it's basically just a, a rubber gear that you attach around the manual focus ring and then you have a little dial on the side of the camera so you can focus in and out that way you're not touching the lens and shaking it um oh there you go (laughs) beautiful i love to see it i got that for christmas from mr chris (laughs) there you go (laughs) well you got to get him into video a little bit you know what's he telling me my my focus sucks i guess so so it's just like hey thanks man (laughs) well I, i found like i was i was shooting this osprey nest in florida this year and uh you know, there's a, there's the mother Osprey's bending down and she's feeding, uh, you know, I was getting tight shots, basically the head shots and there's two or three chicks in the nest. So the autofocus doesn't know all the time, which one it wants to go, you know, you're trying to get it to. Yeah. So as the mom would bend down, it would focus to her. Then she pull out. So the focus is always going in and out. So perfect scenario to use the, the manual, the manual focus with the focus puller, put it right on there, leave it there. And then you can just subtly in and out, things like that. Um, it definitely has a place and it's not that cumbersome to attach. Oh, for sure. Yeah. If you have rails, I think it's just, yeah, there's a little small rail that mounts. Yeah. There's an attachment as well, depending on which one you've got. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Actually the rails is a good point too, because I use a video cage around all my cameras. Even if I'm not shooting video, I like the cages better than the L brackets because one, they have an L bracket built in Two, it's extra protection. It fully surrounds the camera. So I'm always dropping things totally. and breaking them. And so um, just a little yeah. extra protection. So. Yeah, that's what I, I mean, you probably see it back there. I can grab, probably grab it, I guess, but it's got rails and I use cages on everything too. It's a, it's just nice having them there and it's, you yeah. can attach things to it and, and they don't get in the mm-hmm. way at all. I mean, it actually, I no. feel more comfortable when I take the cage off sometimes for like sports action shots. I'm like, I want the cage back on. I just feels more yeah. comfortable <laughs> with it on, right? 
so so speaking of um you know breaking things um <laughs> i heard recently you had uh, nice uh something segue. happened to you in uh, on one of your uh, costa rica uh workshops yeah uh so, <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> oh, there's a tear. I see a tear. Yeah. No. So uh, we had got to this lodge, and uh, I, I'm looking from the parking lot. I'm looking straight through off the back deck, and there's a bunch of toucans out on the on the feeders. And I get excited, and I go to run over to this this feeder, and uh, I guess basically I think in kind of looking back, what happened is I don't think that my 600 was fully seated in the tripod in the gimbal head properly and it started to come out and oh, i no. slipped and the whole thing went down and it smashed and then it went even further down and just smashed some more and i mean it was just unrepairable at that no. point so it was a it was a 600 uh is2 and uh, uh yeah that's that was the end no of it, so, um wow yeah, sorry for your luck, loss luckily i have a sorry. yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a, a wife that's a saint that uh, she's uh, kind of cleaned up my messes a few times and kind of surprised me at Christmas with a, an RF 600. So, uh, oh, wow. I'm kind of in debt if I wasn't already. Yeah. So, oh. uh, I, well, I was already in debt, but now I'm even more. Wink, further. wink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely it's, it's... very, very fortunate in that regards, but. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Good for you. I, I feel guilty. Yeah. I feel really guilty about that. One. <laughs> well, guys, check out um, check out uh, Harry's uh, latest video on uh, shooting the 100 to 500 um, RF over uh, three years because you had actually made a little mention. Thank God you had the one the 500 with you because that kind of saved your trip mm, too. Yeah, for, absolutely. Yeah. So having a couple of lenses and uh, you carry a couple of bodies too. Yep. Yeah, I carry the R5 and the R3. Always a backup kind of with you out in the field or. Yep, always have yeah. two. Um, I went on a trip years ago up to Canada, actually, for uh, I went up to Canada for Snowy Owls. And this was years and years ago. And I only had one body at the time. And it was so cold out. It was like minus 20 or 30 Fahrenheit. And the body froze up on me, locked up, wouldn't do anything. And I think from jumping in and out of the car, the, the constant change, you know, I was newer at the time, didn't realize the effect. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that was the end of my trip. And I had driven like seven hours to get there. And it was over. So ever since then, never, never, ever again will I go with only one body. You just never know. Too much can go wrong. No kidding, that's <laughs> Jeez. For sure. Are you you considering um, the R1 at all? Or uh, Yeah, so that's actually, so um, I wasn't with all the rumors. I'm not a high, believe it or not, I'm not a high megapixel fan. Um, I prefer the lower megapixel bodies. Me too. Uh, I shoot a lot, too many nocturnal animals. So um, I like the high ISO performance. The R3 is my favorite camera I've ever used. But now that the rumors seem to be swaying that it's it could possibly be 30 megapixel, it's like, ugh, now I got to get this too. Cause you know, that's kind of the sweet spot. I think, um, I think it's still low enough that it can be sure. really good high ISO performance, but you can also crop a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. so if it is mm -hmm. 30, uh, yeah, I probably would consider it if it came, you know, if they try to blow out the other cameras and go 50 or something, I didn't really have a lot of interest in that just because I already have an R5 and I don't use it that much. Um, I I prefer the R3, so uh, that's just my personal opinion. I prefer well, that. Well, just let your wife know you've got a birthday coming. <laughs> I mean, she, she handled Christmas, okay? So just let her know, yeah. hey, honey, birthday's coming. Uh, yeah. you know, maybe toss in a pre-order or something. I, I don't know. Just, yeah. just an FYI, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, I might be living on the street if I do that. But. Joe, you had the R5 there, and you end up uh, get picking up an R6 Mark II, and if I, if I recall, I mean, you're using the R6 Mark II more than the R5 these days, aren't you? Well, yeah, and that's it. And that just uh, um, just like you were saying, Harry, I mean, the R, R6 Mark II is 24 megapixels, and, you know, the R5 is 45, and it doesn't even compare as far mm -hmm. as high ISO capabilities. Like, Low light conditions, I'm shooting, yeah. I'm shooting 1,600, and it looks like ISO 200 on the R6. And right. half the stuff, I, it looks like I don't even need to use any of the noise or sharpening. It's absolutely insane with the yep. 500 F4 I'm shooting with. And so yeah. I, I've got the grip on there, and that's that's all I've been using. I use the R5 now primarily just for video with that mm. one to four, uh, with the one to 400 with the um, EF to RF um, adapter with the, the variable ND. Yeah. 
like I'm loving that that camera. It's yeah. So I can't imagine, you know, how how good the the R3 is. Mm-hmm. But like you said, that sweet spot, you know, the 24 between the 24 and the 45. Yeah, yeah. 30. Just that little bit extra megapixel size and still that high ISO. Yeah, I mean that's that's the downside with the the R3 with the 24 megapixel. Of course, you know, you can't crop as much and. Um, Mm -hmm. but that's where the trade-off comes in with the high ISO performance, less megapixels, cleaner image. So, um, but there are times where you take the shots like, man, I I wish I could just, just a little bit more, you know, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I totally get that. So it's, it's, um, you know, um, talking to other photographers, especially, um, people just starting out and stuff, they are kind of surprised to hear that they're, they're figuring, you know, the more megapixels, the, you know, um, the better the eyes, the ISO should be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But mm. once you start to explain to, to them um, why that is, um, mm. then it starts to make sense. And um, right. no, it's, it's just, just, it's just one of those things where um, I, I think um, beginners are um, not misled, but just the misunderstanding that, absolutely, yeah. you know, bigger isn't always better as far as even ISO performance. Right. So, mm-hmm. So yeah, um, so Harry, uh, obviously you've got, got quite a social media presence. You got an awesome YouTube channel and stuff. Um, can you maybe explain to us a little bit how you approach uh, social media? Um, so, so the kind of the funny thing is, um, I, I'm probably like the worst example of <clears throat> as far as like the social media strategy <laughs> goes because, like, I'll post a photo yeah. of like a bar down and I'll write bar down in Florida. No hashtags, no nothing else. I'm really bad with replying to people, <laughs> which I feel terrible about. But, you know, like I and again, I don't mean this to mm-hmm. sound pretentious in any way, but I have four pretty large accounts. Um, so it's like I can't go in and like reply to every single comment. So like a lot of them I miss and I feel oh, horrible sure. about it, but yeah. it's just the way it is. And so, you know, mm-hmm. I don't really reply. I'm bad at commenting on other people's stuff, even though I see it. So I kind of do everything wrong. But to me and again, I'm not in no way trying to toot my own horn but to me what i think it comes down to is if you just continue to post quality stuff it sooner or later it's gonna get seen and that was kind of the thing that i always stuck by and for the longest time i started to get that little bit of i kind of got in a rut and i got a little bit i don't want to say jealous but for lack of a better term i was starting to get jealous of some of these people that were blowing up on stuff that i was like really you know and and uh (laughs) It, you know, why isn't my stuff, you know, I kind of had that whole attitude for a while. And I was oh. like, this is, you know, it, we all toxic. have it. It's we all do it, man. We and, all yeah, do it. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. But, you know, I kind of just kept pushing through and I'm like, my, I'm just going to keep posting and whatever happens, happens. And, and I've been kind of fortunate enough that I think for me, because I had a huge stockpile of video when things went to reels, um, I think I, it was a good time for me because I had so much cool video footage of these animals over the years that, you know, if you just get a good behavior, um, I think that's kind of the mm-hmm. key, right? So with wildlife, totally. if you post a, an owl on a branch and it just is kind of looking left and then it looks right, you know, the, the big thing with social media these days is you need uh, retention. You have to get people to stay on your, your videos. You have to keep their attention, right? So y- you want quick clips. You want the quick hits and you want good behavior. You know, the, the mm-hmm. elk bugling always tend to do well. The loons calling, stuff like that. Um, the animals hunting, that's going to go both ways. You're going to get people yelling at you because, you know, I don't want to see animals hunting other animals, blah, blah, blah. But guess what? Any comment is a good comment as far as engagement goes. Right. You betcha. Uh, the algorithm doesn't know a good comment from a bad comment. Yeah. Uh, the funniest thing to me is one of my earliest best performing thing uh, posts was uh, I posted a great gray owl, but I used to copy uh, hashtags from a previous post and then paste them. And I accidentally called the owl an eagle and I went to bed and I woke up in the morning and I had like 3000 <laughs> comments of people call me an idiot. And uh, nice. I was like, oh, maybe I should start doing this, you know? Um, but the, you That's know, the, awesome. the thing is, <laughs> so, so the algorithms are always changing. Every time you get them figured out, uh, I feel like they go yeah. in a different direction. Totally. I'm finding for, for mm-hmm. me personally right now, um, the non hashtags is actually working better. I don't put any hashtags. Um, I don't know why, you know, but to me, I, I've tested this over and over. And for me personally, posts that I put hashtags in do worse. I don't know if there's any reason to that or if it's just dumb luck. Um, Weird. That's <laughs> been my own findings. Um, the other thing too is I'm not big on the trends. You know, I don't do the whole, this lens costs 
$13,000, was it worth it type thing? And no offense to the people that do that. If that's your thing, great. You know, it's your space. That's just not me. I just post wildlife videos. You know, I don't fall into the trend. I don't do the trend, the sure. audios, the trend. I, the, to me, the more you're trying to chase mm-hmm. it, the more transparent that becomes. And, you know, find your niche and stick to it. And if you do it, and if you start to do it well and you build up, people are going to notice sooner or later, you mm-hmm. know, and these days it's, it's hard. I know advice. it's a great suggestion. Yeah. Um, I started as a test. I started a secondary account that I actually didn't tell anybody about. And I started posting some of my B roll stuff and, you know, it was hard, you know, just to see if I could build a following off of it. And I couldn't, you know, so it's, it's a hard time right now. There's so much competition that's oversaturated. So, you know, but just stick to what you enjoy. Don't worry about what other people want, you know, if, Post what you like and and that's all you can do and whatever happens, happens. So oh, great advice. I always tell Joe, I mean, even I tell everybody, I mean, you know, people are gonna love what you do and people are gonna hate what you do. As long as you're happy with what you're doing, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Just just stay in your lane and just have fun, right? So yeah, mm-hmm, it sure. is what it is, right, Joe? Uh he says that all the time. It is what yeah. it is. Like, <laughs> Would you yeah. stop? It's not what it is. <laughs> I want this. <laughs> Someone's got FOMO. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, hey, yeah, let's talk about that for a second there. Uh, Harry, you must get FOMO all the time when you're out there, right? Like I do. And, you know, and that's, um, that's kind of a thing, too, with social media these days, too, is, you know, a lot of people are they don't want to see you flying in a plane every other week and stuff. And I try to be conscious of that. I don't like the look at me type thing. You know, I was fortunate enough to fly, you know, whatever, first class a couple of times, which is also not a thing I get to do very often. And it's like, I'm not going to go and post, look at me. Here I am in first class on a plane on my way to Alaska or wherever I was going, you know, and like, right. So, yeah. you, you know, you kind of have to also, you know, for me, it's always weird to me. Like, I don't think of myself as, you know, like an influencer or anything like that, but I do have a fairly large following. So there's a lot of eyeballs on the things that I post. So it's, I try to be conscious of that stuff. You know, there's people that are, You know, I was one of them not that long ago. I'm sitting in an office working, you know, nine to five job. I don't want to see some guy going to Africa 10 times a year or whatever they're doing. You know, so, sure, you know, you kind of have to be subtle about it in the same way. Um, And you're going to get hate from people, you know, on social media. Unfortunately, that's the world these days, too. You know, a lot of people are jealous and right for so, I guess, in a way. But you don't like you exactly. But like you said, just if I don't like something, you know, just scroll along. That's it. You know, move move on with my Exactly. Yeah. So. And you're right. Don't chase it. Just do your thing. Right. Just just find yeah. your niche, run with it. Or And, you know, it sometimes takes a while to find your niche. But once you do, you know, just run with it. You don't, you know, try it out for more than three weeks, you know, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, Chris is still trying to find his. So. Hey, <laughs> he's not sure if video is the way to go. Oh yeah, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Only twenty-seven years of broadcasting experience, eh, Chris? Yeah, yeah still not no, sure. I, oh yeah, I was in broadcasting for twenty-seven years on the technical side, not behind the camera, but just on the technical in general. And I just find myself, uh, you know, I still keep going back to video, and I just really feel, you know, video is driving the world. And and uh, mm-hmm. as much as I love photography. I just keep going back to the video and wanting to catch that behavior and the action and all that, just like all your sure. videos. I mean, we've, we both followed you for a long time and we love all your content and man, I could watch your videos forever. And just to be able to capture so, just a little bit of that would be so awesome. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, in our neck of the woods, we, we do have the, 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 uh, the amazing environments in, in Jasper and Waterton and Banff and, you know, pretty close to Calgary here. So it's, it's nice. And, uh, yeah, we, we just need to get out there a little bit more. So get out there mm-hmm. and have fun. That's it. And a lot of it's luck, you know, right place, right time. And yeah. Um, oh, it is. But again, last yeah. last thing I'll kind of say on that too is, you know, the ones that I find that um, tend to do better is the ones that you can almost kind of tell a story with. Um, I have a couple of woodpecker posts that, uh, pileated woodpeckers that, you know, I'll let you in on a little secret. Those were shot over, I think, two years over different five different locations in three oh, different really? states. So, you know, but I pieced wow. it all together in a way that the woodpecker's building the hole. It's, you know, let's bring it, it's going out to look for food and it has ba- chicks, babies, whatever. And then, you know, it's feeding them at the end, but it's that storyline, you know, so that's going to kind of totally. keep your attention as well, rather than just, Hey, here's a woodpecker on a tree. Um, and the big thing that that's I mentioned awesome. with, with, with the audio as well, um, you know, videos like that, especially woodpeckers, mm-hmm. like unless they're banging on a tree, there's no audio and most of those are in parks in florida you know there's people driving by and stuff right so um i come from a a more of a musical background so to me i try to find the the audio tracks that are kind of more emotional but also fit like you don't want the the 
techno dance beats going, you know, like you're in a club or something, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with the funny audios, you know, if you can get a good funny one to match. But what I found is if you want people to kind of rewatch your video, which is key, they're not going to keep watching the ones with the, the dumb people talking and, you know, whatever, trying to be funny type. Right. Thing. Sure. But if you can get a yeah. good emotional, something that is, extracts that emotion, um, that's going to be, you know, they're tend to repeat a little bit more. So I don't know. Just what, what's worked for me. Good, nice. Whatever that's worked. Good awesome. to know. Good Thanks for, for the sure. Tip. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what I've been trying to do with some of the stuff. I, I had been uh, just posting the odd video clip here and there with music and I just, I was looking for my niche and I have a voiceover background. So I attempted a, there was a Hawk Owl video. I don't know if you saw it and I added voiceover to it, kind of a learning thing. And I think I'm going to try that mm -hmm. a little bit more too, a bit of a story behind those. And I think you're exactly, right. I think those yeah. are pretty intriguing. And Cool. So, so you got any projects on the go right now, uh, Harry, or you got any books in the works or, you know, any of that kind of stuff? So, so this year is kind of <laughs> wide open for me. Um, of, of, for some personal reason, I kind of put off a lot of travel throughout the at least the first half of the year other than uh, one trip. So I think what I'm going to focus on more is the YouTube side of things. Uh, I want to get into a lot mm -hmm. more nice. uh, gear reviews and things like that. And to me, my favorite thing in the world is um, I want to shoot nature documentaries. I always wanted to do the BBC style stuff. I have a lot of videos like that where mm -hmm. I've, I've put stories together. I've hired narrators and done all that. A couple of them taken off. Some of them haven't. But if you want to be a YouTuber, especially a photographer, I hate that term YouTuber, but anyway, um, <laughs> it's inevitable that you're going to have to do gear reviews at some point. I mean, it's really the only way, in my yeah. opinion, unless mm -hmm. you get really lucky, you know, so um, so I'm kind of starting to do a lot more of that stuff. And, you know, it, it, anything that helps other people, um, you know, I'm all for it as well, too. You know, I get a lot of questions and that's the other thing, too. A lot of messages, you know, what camera do you recommend? What lens? What bag? How do you travel? This mm -hmm. all that kind oh, of stuff. For sure. So, if I can have one place where, okay, here's the answer. And then I could just send you a link that'll allow me to be more uh, engaging to messages and clear out some of my inbox and things like that as well. So, oh, great idea. hundred percent. That's actually yeah. a great idea um, to, to do that because, you know, we get the same, especially with the, the F-stop bags and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> to, to be able to just say, Hey, check out this video. It'll tell you everything, uh, you know, we talked about, um, is a good idea yeah for sure uh, i think it'll uh really work out well for you harry just yeah. every single do your review like you said on every single piece of equipment you got and forward the link oh, yeah. yeah or yeah. take them to right. a general page where it has all the gear r5 and then the review link and then our, yeah. our, our r3 and then a review link and yeah that's that's awesome mm. and it'll get people to your youtube channel too and get more views and possible subscribers and all that kind of stuff so it's a good idea. Yep. Oh, for sure. Cool. If you're looking for a narrator, give me a call. <laughs> hey, I might take you up on that because uh, yeah. the, the one, the one guy I was working on, he did actually. Uh, my, I think it was the lion video, and then I went back to him after I got a couple more views, and the price doubled on me. I was like, oh, what the heck? Oh no! <laughs> so, but but the ironic thing is, it got, it got demonetized, so uh, I can't make money off that video anyway because it was too gory for advertising on YouTube. Oh. Apparently, because. It, I uh, see. So, yeah, it crossed uh, the line, did it? <laughs> yeah. But they didn't take it down. No, it can still be the views. So, I mean, I can still get subscribers. And I think you can still make uh, people that pay for YouTube premium, you get a little bit, you know, like whatever, 10 bucks a month off it or something like that. But, sure. but uh, you know, that was, mm -hmm. you know, I was getting into the millions of views. It was pretty nice. <laughs> a little bit extra income for a while, but. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, geez, hey, that's too bad. Yeah, for sure. So. I never thought of that, actually. Yeah, that's crazy. So. So um, do you have any workshops, uh, anything, um, you know, let the viewers know about as far as uh, coming up uh, for 2024? You said maybe what, the second half or? Yeah, I'm looking at the second half. I'm hoping to uh, get back up with you guys maybe in the in the fall again. I have, nice. again, my schedule is kind of just a mess right now. So I'm trying to get some things finalized. Um, I'm doing a private thing with somebody in Costa Rica in March. And then, you know, I'm hoping to get my fall schedule updated on my website soon. So mm -hmm anybody's interested uh check that out <laughs> and uh for oh, sure, for I, sure. I, you know within the next couple of weeks i hope to get that lined up uh get some things finalized finally so scheduling conflicts are always a challenge so oh for sure yeah that's for sure and you and you sell all your artwork as well right and is, they just go through your website for that too or uh yeah i have a link uh, i actually do most of it through etsy um but it, just because of the extra foot traffic that that brings in but there is a link on my website as well yeah i do sell prints and all that kind of stuff uh, but yeah, you can find that all through the website. Great. Nice. Sounds good. 
Uh, so, Harry, uh, what's um, one of your biggest challenges right now? Uh, it could be anything from, you know, uh, travel, um, you know, uh, gear, um, you know, uh, anything to do with the business. Becoming a YouTuber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Becoming yeah. a YouTuber. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I guess the biggest challenges right now with, with your, uh, with your business. Uh, so for me, the, the business for me, I think is at least the business side of it is what I'm finding these days is I'm trying to word this carefully. So there's a lot of people that are running, uh, especially international tours these days. Um, and there's very limited space as to where you can stay on a lot of these trips. And what's happening is I think a lot of people are starting to go, they go on a trip and they maybe go once and they think, oh, I can run this. And they book all the accommodations because a lot of the international stuff, you don't have to uh, necessarily, you can hold the reservation up to two weeks before and then you can release it and you don't have to pay. Mm -hmm. So whether or not they fill it, there's no risk. And what I'm finding is a lot of the places that I used to work in, I can't get reservations for two to three years out. So that's part of why some of my workshops are up in the air right now. Um, oh, okay. So as far wow. as the business oh. side of it goes, that's, that's the business challenge. The, the personal side of me shooting, I think, is things kind of becoming redundant, uh, especially on social media, trying to be different, um, mm -hmm. trying to find new ways to shoot, you know, kind of you see the same thing over and over again. Just, you know, what's the next level of how I can film wildlife? And to me, that's the hardest part because there's kind of two levels. There's kind of what the majority of, of us do. And then there's the Bertie Gregory's of the world that have shot overs on boats and helicopters and can drive through forests, following animals through a forest with drones and things like that. So how do you sure. get to that level without being on that level, you know, with mm -hmm. working for Disney plus and having sure. that infinite budget, you know? So, sure um, yeah. so again, you know, I'm trying to reinvent almost the way that I'm filming things, but with wildlife, mm -hmm. the main challenge is you're kind of given what you're presented with, you know, you can't set up shots unless you're, setting up shots, if you know what I mean, um, mm -hmm. which I don't do. So it's whatever I'm out seeing is I'm taking what I can get. So, you know, there's that balance of how can I mm -hmm. be different versus, you know, not seeing action going on when I go on a trip, you know, this year for me and, and Jasper, as you guys kind of noticed was there was a lot of people there and there was not a lot of action. So, um, sure. Mm -hmm. What can you do? Yeah. <laughs> you know stuff like that and when where there was action we weren't there so <laughs> yeah. yeah right yeah and, and the FOMO kicks in right the FOMO it's like yeah. you know mm -hmm. you, you meet yeah. you bump into somebody later oh my god you should have seen this elk fight we had they were crossing the river and the, I was like oh FOMO right it's just like yeah. ah we just missed that while we we're all sitting there having a, something to eat and a, and a coffee <laughs> yeah, no right because nothing was going on where we were at so yeah. it happens for sure so yeah so Harry, what's what's one thing with uh, you know the new photographers just starting out, or or even the photographers that have shot in a long time and maybe want to move into the video side? Is there any uh, any um, advice you give those who are just wanting to try to become a photographer or even move into the video side? Um, yeah, I think, and, and I actually think this part at least can apply to both videographers and photographers. YouTube these days, I mean, I wish YouTube was a thing when I was first starting. I mean, there's just an infinite amount of resources on there. Um, you can learn so much. The biggest thing, like anything else, is, is just practice, practice, practice. Um, things that I mentioned that'll maybe propel your success rate are using tripods, learning to shoot more stable, um, learning how to set the proper shutter speeds right from the beginning. Um, that way, you know, you're starting good habits from early on. So, you know, maybe searching YouTube for how do I set shutter speed for video there's an idea don't steal that from me um and then uh, <laughs> i just wrote it know, down actually having all the right gear <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know just just starting the good habits early on and even if your technique isn't necessarily the best in the beginning you're gonna learn what you're doing wrong pretty quickly um i don't think video is as cumbersome as people think that it is especially the video editing um we didn't really touch on that a whole lot but Video editing, a lot of people open Premiere, DaVinci, and I could just see their eyes roll back in their head. And, you know, when you really see how little you need to do, um, it becomes a lot easier. So, you know, just not getting overwhelmed um, and just keeping things very simple. Uh, it, it actually can be a lot easier than, than what it seems. So do you use Premiere? Because uh, I myself, like Chris is uh, uh, trying to teach me Premiere. And uh, when I do open it up, like, I mean, when I go to Chris's house and he's got a wall 
with monitors and things <laughs> open and he's got these panels on this one and panels on that one and I'm looking at that and I'm like you don't have I just want to wanna, yeah, I just want to do a reel that follows the head of this owl as it's flying yeah. through and, and what are those called key um uh, key frames key frames you know hey, but I, uh, it I have a uh, I have a tutorial of that on my YouTube page so of that exact thing just saying I watched it <laughs> you do it's very good actually yes it's good but um is it uh so I I guess Premiere is your go to you mentioned DaVinci also. Yeah, I use Premiere Pro. Um, I use that basically <coughs> since I started. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say that. I started in iMovie and a lot of people laugh, but iMovie can do a lot of the stuff to get mm -hmm. you started if you're not ready to, to purchase mm -hmm. uh, sure. you know, a, a video software. DaVinci is free. In my personal opinion, um, the DaVinci Resolve is the better software, but it has a much steeper learning curve. I think Premiere, especially if you come from a photography background, it's a little like using uh, Photoshop and Lightroom. Um, you know, it's slider based, things like that. If I had to compare, if I was starting today, it's a tough call. I probably would go to DaVinci only because I think the color grading is much more powerful in DaVinci. I think that's the one area that Premiere lacks, but I'm so much more proficient in Premiere that it's like I just open up. Premiere and I'm like, I just want to get this done. I don't want to go back and kind of relearn the things that I've forgotten over the years, the things that I've updated in DaVinci since I don't use it as much. So oh totally get that. Yeah, totally. Once you live in the Adobe ecosystem and you have all the tools in the Adobe system. And I've been using Adobe products since they came out. I just there's just no way I can try to relearn something after editing for 30 years on it, you know, on that style, right? Yep. So mm -hmm. No, that's great. I'm glad we you actually brought the software up. Yeah, I was just going to say to it, and it's really only kind of the extreme. I mean, Premiere will get you 99.9% .9 of the way there as far as it goes. But when you get those real contrasty scenes where you're trying to bring back color, you know, highlight adjustments and things, I just think that's where DaVinci kind of shines a little bit better. But other than that, Premiere is fine. And that's why I still use it. You know, I don't have a whole lot of complaints. Totally. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree. I mean, some of the Lightroom functionality that they've added, um, you know, I just wish they add some of those sliders to Premiere oh. because I think they would even just just help get it a little closer, you know, and uh, yep. yeah, uh, that would be nice. Almost make it look a, a little similar more. <laughs> right. And maybe like a smart subject selection mask where you can track it and edit it, you know, yeah. instead of having the pen, pen oh, tool sure. and track your own <laughs> mask and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but yeah, anyway. that would be great. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> sure. It <laughs> shows like whatever, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that all sounds, sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll go into my Lightroom and just hit auto and adjust contrast yeah. and, you know, a little <laughs> bit of, uh, you know, highlights and shadows. And, no, I'm just kidding. But no, I, I, I totally get it. Um, I'm, 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 gra I'm glad we actually brought that up, uh, the software side, because that was one thing that uh, – we should have brought up a little earlier so it's uh, i think it's good for the the viewers to know that and, and get your uh, get your opinion on that so thanks for that harry yeah and, and like harry said he's got that okay. that amazing tutorial you know when creating the reel creating the movement with the keyframe mm -hmm. so go check it out guys yeah that was um, that great was, that was a great little reel yeah, uh, video there for sure on youtube <laughs> yeah yeah for sure it's awesome well guys uh we're gonna wrap things up here um harry really appreciate you coming on yeah thanks harry. Um, that's awesome yeah, really had a, a good chat here. I'm, I'm sure our viewers are going to get a lot from, from this video here. And everyone that's watching, again, we really appreciate you uh, taking your time out to, to watch these videos. And uh, if you do like, please like, please share, and please subscribe. We'll uh, catch you guys in the uh, next video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for joining us on the Nature Photo Guys podcast. If you have any questions, contact us at info at thenaturephotoguys.ca or message us on Facebook and Instagram at The Nature Photo Guys Podcast. Visit YouTube and subscribe to our channel to watch all our latest videos or follow and listen to our latest podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on our website at thenaturephotoguys.ca. We'll catch you next time on The Nature Photo Guys Podcast. Podcast.